Meine sehr verehrten Ladies and Gentlemen, dear friends of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, my name is Ellen Überscher and I'm the president of this uh, foundation and I'm quite happy to be able to welcome you. Uh, Quo Vadis, European Union, where is the European Union headed now? And we have an annual conference on this topic. However, this year, of course, it uh, takes place against a very special background, which is the European election, which has brought about several peculiar peculiarities. I would like to mention three things. First of all, the participation of voters. 51% overall in Germany, we had a voter participation of 61% compared to 2014. It is an increase of 13%. However, in Poland, we have seen an increase of 22% to 45% which is quite a high number for Central Europe. In other countries, we have a participation of less than 15% uh, or an increase to 25, rather. And even in Great Britain, which actually wanted to leave, um, we have seen an increased participation, 37%, which is the second highest participation of voters in the UK since the accession to the European Union. This means that the democratic legitimization of the European Parliament is better than it ever was. And it's also a sign for the fact that the citizens in the European Union consider the EU as one political sphere of action and that they want to shape this sphere. So it's even more important now to thoroughly analyze the election results for Germany. And most of you, of course, know the headlines, know the news. Um, in contrast to earlier developments, we've seen a process where the effects of the European election results have a major impact on the domestic policy. And of course, it would uh, entice many people to um, analyze, for example, also the resignation of Andrea Nahles. But it would be wrong to stop with the analysis of the European election results from a European point of view. And this would include a risk which Ulrich Beck um, a few years ago took up um, in a visionary way. Whereas uh, Thomas Mann in 1953 warned of a German Europe um, and who called for Europeanized Germany, Ulrich Beck saw a completely different phenomenon at the peak of the crisis in Greece. Um, he said that the, uh, that without a, the political intention we have seen a Europeanized Germany, which has now entered into a German Europe. And if we, as a, a Green Political Foundation, make a Europe our topic, then we have the clear objective to make the voices of others in the European context heard and also to strengthen the European Germany and not the uh, German Europe. And finally, we need also to be able to pick up this finality question and to further develop Europe in a progressive way. Our um, election results analysis is now focused on European perspectives, which hopefully um, in this green Berlin and the double sense of the word uh, are being heard here. Second issue. The pro-European pro forces in this political election have been able to maintain their power. This, of course, sounds comforting at first sight. So what many observers would have um, or have um, forecasted, um, which is a shift to the right, uh, did not take place. However, just consider such a statement in the 1990s. Nobody would have understood what this was supposed to express, that the pro-Europeans were able to maintain their political power. I mean, at that point of time, it was just natural. Um, more Europe skeptic or right-wing movements 
have increased since they first emerged. When 2004, a new um, political group um, made up of Eurosceptics became part of the European Parliament. At the head of it was Nigel Farage, and nobody took them very seriously. It seemed to be a fringe phenomenon. However, this fringe phenomenon has become bigger and is now a real threat for the European project. And it's very important to see the following. This threat did not emanate from Central or Eastern Europe, but from Western Europe. Of course, an overarching majority of the electorate decided for um, in favor of pro-European parties in 2019. However, the change in the political landscape um, is a fact. A view to Italy, France, or Hungary shows that we still have to strengthen the pro-European majorities in order to stabilize them. Nothing would be more wrong than now to lay back and to remain idle. Uh, together, two of uh, the three anti-European parliamentary groups uh, have the same number of seats as the Social Democrats from 118 to 175 seats, which is more than one quarter of the whole members of parliament. And, of course, the group of the right-wing populists are, uh, is a bit complicated. Some of them are representing um, positions that are not progressive, which, with which we can deal. However, others are actually um, uttering doubts in the rule of law, in freedom of opinion, in minority rights. And these are things that we cannot accept. So the undermining of the basic European uh, understanding of democracy is actually um, or will be the death for a um, social, more just and economic and ecologically um, um, growing European Union. The decisive question for the European Commission, the Parliament and the European Council will be how can we strengthen the trust in the European project, trust that was lost with many citizens in Europe. The election result also means that the elections are expecting something from the EU. A Polish colleague has therefore proposed that before the first State of the Union speech of the new Commission president, he or she should conduct town hall meetings all over Europe in order to learn what the Europeans are thinking and what's important for them. Third point. The question how we can stabilize and regain trust in the European project is not only a question of the institutions. Throughout Europe as a whole, there's a wave of anti-populist movements which do not accept the status quo um, and who do not accept the rise of right-wing authoritarian and anti-liberal forces. And this can also be seen in the increase in um, turnout or in, in election result uh, for the Greens in Ireland, for example, or Belgium and France, or for uh, Pirati in, in the Czech Republic, or Vyosna in Poland, they gained 6% uh, right from the outset. So um, in a politicized and highly polarized country, this is actually a huge success. Last but not least, of course, we have the great result of the German Greens, who were the second, um, or came second, actually, and in many of the, um, uh, in many regions, they actually uh, ranked first. So the Greens are the original. They deal with a topic that will um, determine the agenda of the future of the next decade, which is the social question, but also uh, eco ecology and the transformation um, while maintaining the liberal order. Europe's anti-populist movement is based on a public which is more strongly net uh, networked, so to speak, or intertwined. and. The movement Fridays for Future, for example, is a good example for this new European um, situation um, for a generation which um, does not have the feeling that the post-war order is the way they want to see it. Um, 
they want to see a more ecological, more social, more democratic Europe. Whether Germany will be able to participate in this agenda in a constructive way, the current government will be measured by that. And approximately a year ago, they announced um, a change for Europe. And Europe is more than the European Parliament, the Council, or the Commission. Europe is uh, comprising of its citizens, citizens that are standing up for um, rule of law, democracy, humanity, uh, no matter whether it's in Warsaw, Bucharest, Vienna, London, or Berlin. What we could see over the past months is a European civil society which is discussing about European domestic politics. Europe has, for many people, become a natural framework for political and social debates. And even though those who are participating do not agree, the value of this debate is uh, immeasurable. It's extremely high, because without these debates, there will not be a political process. And this is a success for all Europeans. And for us uh, here now, we would like to uh, continue with this debate. We want to create a space for a debate. We have different experts from uh, different European countries that we invited. We will continue tomorrow in our expert discussions from civil society organizations um, who are championing an open and democratic Europe. And today we will focus on the following question. What are the challenges that we are faced with based on the uh, election results? And where is the European Union headed after these remarkable elections? Before starting with the analysis, I would like to cordially thank our cooperation partners. Jeff, the Green European Foundation, with whom we have prepared and conduct this uh, event, and also the European section and the team of Christine Pütz, Claudia Rothe, and Ulrike Pusch for your great organization. Now, um, it was my plan to say that we will continue with the following, I would like to pass the microphone to two men and one woman, and together with me, um, the gender balance would once again be uh, reached, but we have changed it. I would like to pass the mic to three men, but uh, we will still have a good debate, and we will integrate uh, all the different questions. And I would like to welcome Michael Tumann that he is uh, taking over the job of Petra Pinsler, who was supposed to be the host here, the moderator. And due to domestic policy changes, she had to take over different tasks. And this is why we are very glad that Michael Thurman is was able to take over here. And at this point, I would also like to congratulate very cordially Sven Giegold as the uh, top candidate of the Greens. And also Sergei Lagudinsky, who is sitting in the back here and who's one of our new EU parliamentarians of the parliamentary group of the Greens. So congratulations to you. There is a huge interest. This is what we've already uh, noticed um, in the question. How did we successfully link social movements and um, policies? However, this is not supposed to be our topic now. Now we would like to take a look at Europe, and I'm quite happy that Ivan Krastev and Sven Giegold will give keynotes moderated by Michael Tumann. So enjoy. Thank you very much, Ms. Um, Überscher. I will try to replace Petra Pinsler, uh, a correspondent for a year, but um, unfortunately, I cannot be the second woman in this uh, group here, um, and I'm not going to try. So the European elections 
um, or before the European elections, many people f had fears. And what I think was very interesting about the result is that it was not um, explicit. On the one hand, it was very European, it was very diverse, and this is a good thing. All the major forecasts that there will be a right wing shift did not happen. But we can neither say that there was no shift at all, because in Great Britain, Hungary, and Italy, we have seen a different picture. On the other hand, we see the rise of liberals, of the Greens, and this is actually contradicting this, um, this other trend. However, at a day like today, where many people talk about the resignation of Adrian Nahles, um, I uh, do not want to contradict myself, of course. Um, the people's parties, the major parties, um, are they declining? Well, I mean, we can say this um, for the European elections because they um, won more seats in Spain and other countries. And in Greece, the Nea Demokratia, uh, a right-wing party once again gained power. So, of course, many things can be interpreted here. But what is very important to say is, and this is also based on the results, that Europe is faced with far-reaching changes and that there is a polarization in many areas uh, to a different extent in different regions. And this polarization can be considered negative, but it can also be considered hopeful it can be considered a topic or like a utopia, utopia that now translates into our daily lives or into practical side. And we want to talk about all these different aspects on this panel. On the one hand, with Ivan Krasyev, who is the chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies. And most of the time, if he's not in Berlin, and I think uh, just recently we met, he is in Vienna at the Institute for Human Sciences. And to my right, Sven Giegold, the spokesperson of the European uh, Greens and the top candidate for Alliance 90 and the Greens at this European election. So first of all, I'd like to ask Ivan Krastev. You published this renowned book, um, Democracy disrupted or after Europe. Um, and there you describe a Europe which is a little bit um, distorting or leading to anxiety. So did you see a confirmation in these European elections or d did the European elections contradict you in some ways? He said, in the way Michael cannot pretend to be a woman, I cannot pretend to be a German speaker. So I want to <laughs> first to get basically this excuse. Uh, secondly, on the elections, at least there are four things that I'm taking out of it. Uh, together with Piotr, we have been part of this big survey effort that European Council on Foreign Relations did. Uh, and nevertheless, that there was a lot of fears before the elections. One of the interesting stories about these elections was the results were not surprising as a whole. There was surprise for me, fortunately. Poland was not uh, something that I expected. But in general, uh, four things were clear even before the elections. First, that people were taking these elections much more seriously than ever European elections before. People had the feeling that something important is at stake, so the higher turnout was not a surprise. Secondly, which was coming very clearly, was that people want to change all over Europe, but it does not mean that they're moving simply to the far right. I do believe here is where some people, uh, like Mr. Bannon, made a mistake. Uh, there was a genuine push for change, but people were moving in totally different directions. And of course, the success of the Green Party, I can imagine that being now the foundation of the most popular party, according to the opinion polls, makes a difference. Uh, but uh, this was also a result of this way for change. Even Macron, what you don't know from the data is that those who declare that they're going to vote for Macron, majority of them believe that Europe does not work. So strangely enough, this was all parties that want to change something, but in a totally different directions. From this point of view, the populist right 
and the Greens and some of the East European anti-corruption liberals, he has three things in common. This is the only two that have a movement structure. What you can see on the street is only Green Fridays or Yellow Jacket weekends. Basically, the mainstream parties you're not going to see on the street at all. Secondly, uh, both of us, both of them wants to save life, but while basically the Greens wants to save life on Earth, uh, the populist uh, uh, right wants to save their way of life. But this is very kind of... And thirdly, and this is a major difference, while the populist right is very unhappy with what the European Union is doing, if you see to the Greens that they are much more unhappy with what it is not doing. Concerning climate, but not only. So from this point of view, but I'm saying that you have two movements coming out of this. Uh, and also the third thing that comes for me and important is look at the political groups because people talk about fragmentation and fragmentation is a major characteristics. But fragmentation has three different dimensions. One is that you have a majority which is not the socialists and conservatives anymore. But secondly, look at the groups. They are not simply political families. They are becoming much more regional families. Socialist groups is very much the south. It's because of the Sanchez success, it was the Italians. It's very much dominated by the Southern Europe. Uh, if you see the Greens, it's Western Europe and Northern Europe. There are not much Central and Eastern Europe there. If you look to the Conservative, it is basically CDU and East Europeans mostly. Uh, populists are much more kind of evenly distributed in many of the countries. I'm saying this because here I do believe Ulrich Beck should not, uh, should, his fear was not right. Germany did not, as a country, gain out of these elections. Because before part of German influence was based on the fact that the two big groups, the Socialists and Christian Democrats, were very much influenced by two big parties on both sides. So the Grand Coalition in Brussels was also the Grand Coalition in Berlin. Now the Social Democrats are in a much weaker position in the Socialist group than they have been ever before. And to be honest, I do believe CDU is also in a much weaker position with the EPP than it was ever before. I'm saying this because for me, the interesting question that you're asking, well, I was wrong on many things. First of all, uh, for sure, one of the things that is very clear after these elections is that there is no exit parties anymore. Most of these right-wing populist parties, they're not advocating anymore leaving the European Union. None of them, neither Le Pen, nor Salvini. They believe that they can control the EU, to remake the EU, they'd want to want to get out. On the other side, there is no major party that is advocating open borders. So from this point of view, when it comes to migration issue, there is also kind of a new consensus when it comes to the external borders. What in my view is going to change very much is a generational divide. And here, nevertheless, that there is not a green movement on Central and Eastern Europe, probably the East-West divide is as less sharp than people expect. Because simply, you have the success of some of the liberal anti-corruption parties in Slovakia, in Romania. They were also very much worried about climate, but it was much more political climate. So they were much more trying to clean the elites uh, than... Uh, I'm saying this because my last point is about something what, in my view, is going to affect the European Parliament and uh, elections very much. While we have been focusing very much on the European elections, something in the world was changing a lot. And probably I'm very much influenced by the fact that I spent quite a lot of time uh, last month in the United States. United States and China are in a Cold War. We can like it or dislike it. But, and this is not a Trump's war against China. This is America's wars against China. And the Democrats are part of it. As a result of it, we are going to see so much major changes in the next two or three years. Nevertheless, where we stand on this, because this is going to result in a major division of digital world. What the technology companies are talking about when chips start to disagree. So in a certain way, you're going to decide with what kind of a search machine you're going. And Europe is going to be pushed to make choices. And it's not going to be easy to make choices because we believe that we can regulate this world, but in order to regulate it, we assume that it's going to be a common world. And even on the level of the kind of a big technology companies, you're going to have the Chinese world, you're going to have an American world, and Europe is going to enter this world without a big technology champions of its own. 
So in my view, this is going to so much shape the debate. And now when we're talking about the European elections that we have been so much focused, uh, that uh, this is, in my view, something that is uh, uh, going to be critical. And concerning the populace, they didn't do badly. I know that uh, people don't like this, but imagine the following. On the previous elections, they have a lot of votes. It was a protest vote. It was an isolated phenomenon. They did, they did not control any significant country. This is not true anymore. They're going to cooperate much more, which was said before. Uh, secondly, they're going, they, have, they control two countries. And Polish success was also difficult because it's one thing to elect a populist government. It's totally different to re-elect it. Hungary is a different case. I don't believe that it's a free competitive politics in Hungary. This is. It's, I don't believe that it's easy for any opposition to win there. But Poland is like the United States. It's a divided society. It was a major effort also on the side of the opposition. And the third is Italy. If Salvini is going to get the upper hand in Italy, you're going to end up with one of the founding members of the European Union, big country, with the big economy, with the major financial story. So which means that this type of uh, members of European Parliament coming from the populist right, they're going to have support among governments. So this is not simply going to be an opposition in the parliament, but they're going to have a government on the council on their side, and I do believe it's going to make the work of uh, the pro-European majority much more difficult than it is. So let's stop here. Ganz herzlichen Dank, Ivan Krastev. Thank you, Ivan Krastev. Sven Giegold, Ivan has just pointed out the strength of right-wing populists in some countries, among them in central countries of the EU. He also pointed out that Germany, as a result of the end of the long coalition in the EP, might lose in influence on the other hand, the success of the Greens is something that has an impact of Germany and also at the European level. So my question, does this not fulfill a dream where many, for, for which many people worked for? Well, first, I came here at short notice, and I'm very pleased to be here. I really like the motto to be pessimistic in one's thinking and optimistic in one's acting. And with uh, Professor Krasnick, I wanted to get to know somebody who takes the first part seriously. And he didn't completely disappoint me, though he also pointed out some positive elements I would also have highlighted. Let me take up the introduction of Ellen Übersher. She pointed out the new relationship of power. And when you look at the European Parliament after the elections, it is not so new. The bottom line is that the extreme to populist right 120 seats, the extreme left lost 13 and the pro-Europeans lost 11. Given 751 seats, it was not a fateful election, at least not as to its result. Perhaps the mobilization has helped to get out of it. But I think it's more a status quo election with regard to the result. The big change is the composition of the different blocks. Here we have seen change. Let's start with the extreme left. There is a trend that those with extreme anti-European position, they won uh, with weaker position, they lost. Then the composition of countries has changed somewhat. But now we ha hardly have any Tories, but more representatives of the Praxis party. Unfortunately, we also have a few more from Germany in the extreme right. But the big 
change is actually that the Grand Coalition has no longer a majority. So he, we, here we must not only highlight our election success, but also the one of the liberals. And what you said does not really concern the liberals, that there is a division between different regions. They are more or less equally distributed, but they differ a lot. Liberals from different countries are very different, right-wing uh, liberal to left-wing liberals. We find all of them. And this is also reflected by the fact that in the negotiations, some want uh, a hostage to, be, to get a top post. And uh, well, then they have a, a, a special parliament president, and one third doesn't know what they want. What is decisive now is that what was normal in the legislative process that all Europeans reasonably talk to each other, now they have to do it. Uh, so far, not a lot has happened on this level, but generally speaking, I can say the uh, voters' participation was up. The result was more pro-European and also more pro-climate protection. So there is not a lot of room for a lot of pessimism. And I also, I'm also pleased to see that pro-European movements in several Eastern European countries had a major impact. The uh, result in Romania is a huge success so that the civil society does not accept what their social democratic party did trying to legalize corruption and the people rejected it and there was a high participation. I saw long lines of voters. In a second aspect is what happened in Great Britain. Nigel's Farage Brexit party turned out to be the strongest party, but looking at the others who won votes, it, is, it shows that there are also people who turn their back on Brexit. And well, I have to do something else. I have to welcome my old professor personally. I learned a lot from you, and I'm very pleased that you are here without Klaus. I wouldn't sit here today. The challenge now is can we succeed in this new constellation to overcome the uh, blockage to act? And we have a central task here. We can not say that it, is only, it has only been a climate election. And my experience is different. I was always applauded most if I didn't just speak about climate protection, uh, diversity of species. Uh, I also got a lot of applause that the role of Germany not to answer the uh, question of Macron for one and a half years and then just publish uh, a letter. I got applause not only here at the Bell Foundation. You could do uh, say this in a very distant village. People always noticed that the role of Germany, that there was something wrong. Uh, and we must stop just to talk about persons. Today it's difficult, but it's absurd after such an election. Uh, Germany speaks about AKK, about Nahles, who mistreated whom. This is important, but it's more about the content, not only the content of climate protection. After European elections, it must be possible to ask what 
how is this related to European policies? Unfortunately, this question is hardly asked. I think the consequence must be to talk about European policies, and we have a coalition treaty which says a new departure to Europe. I have been looking for this departure right from the beginning. I didn't find it. So the question is, what policies are needed to develop a new dynamics? And here, uh, the election is an opportunity. We have started to formulate smart compromises. We said not sanction the East Europeans uh, by less money. We said if the uh, uh, countries do not apply with the values, the decisions are be taken in Brussels. A central goal must be that in those countries that have problems with basic rights to strengthen the opposition. And you do not strengthen them by saying, well, we won't give you money, but by saying we uh, withdraw the trust of the government with regard to European funds. And with integration, we said we understood that a forced migration quota does not work, but to create incentives for countries that accept more migrants, this could help. And last but not least, in Germany, we have a special task to break through the transfer unit mantra so uh, that everything related to money is related to transfer union. For each euro you invest, you get money back, especially also in Germany. So we need uh, common investments based on solidarity. And our manifesto gave a figure 1% of the gross national product. And to overcome tax dumping, a compromise for, uh, for, uh, for e with Eastern Europeans. So if investment funds flow back, it could be an attractive deal that is helpful to Europe. And if it is future investment, then uh, we will also push ahead climate protection. I think I should come to an end here, and I'm looking forward to a discussion with a convinced uh, pessimist. Talked about the uh, new balance of, of power in the uh, European Parliament. And that, in fact, we have forces which uh, are much more pro-European and, and also have some new programs uh, in, in, in favor of protection of climate change, uh, in, in protection of uh, the climate. Would you and, and you and your presentation look more at the countries from the inside? And uh, so, but would you agree that maybe the result if you look at Europe as a whole, that the re result much, might be much more positive than you thought. Listen, first of all, for Bulgarian to be very optimistic is not usual. So my <laughs> pessimism is quite moderate for my standard. Uh, uh, secondly, and th this is very important, and to be honest, I was very happy to hear what I heard. Three points. When Tukfil went 19th century to the US, one thing that struck him most about democracy was that for him election was a political machine for producing collective dreaming about the future. He believes that the best about democracy is that it pushes people to think about the future. You promise, you're telling how the world is going to be. Even if you're lying, you're talking about the future. For me, this is critically important because one of the things that I found particularly disturbing about Europe is that last year, 
Bertelsmann Foundation made this study in all 28 uh, member states to discover that 67% of Europeans believe that life was better before. Majority of people in their 20s and 30s. 77% of the Italians. I'm saying this because if you believe that future is something that you should fear, you're lost. You're lost. Uh, and from this point of view, on the East, uh, particularly West, why I'm slightly more pessimistic on this, when you look to the political families, and you say, for example, EPP get this and this, where are you going to put Orban? To be honest, Bulgarian Socialist Party is on the right on the nationalistic issues than the center right. So from this point of view, we always believed that the left is what is left in our country, the right is what is right in our countries. Romanian Social Democrats, how pro-European exactly they are. We're going to put them in a pro uh, In a certain way, their position is much more going to be shaped by the fear of their leaders to end up in jail than in any type of an ideology. So from this point of view, the fragmentation is going within the political families, but also within the parties, uh, particularly when we talk about the traditional parties. It's much more, this is why I do believe it's going to be much more fragmented. But where I do believe you're absolutely right, and this is, to be honest, where my hope comes from. European Union cannot change if Germany is not going to change. It's not simply not answering Macron, but Germany is the biggest country. It's not only about economic size. It's also about intellectual power, universities, bigger societies. And in a certain way, Germany was starting to defend the status quo that does not exist anymore. I'm even not saying is it good or bad. It's over. Uh, and from this point of view, if uh, the success of the Green Party, from my point of view, the biggest impact is exactly what is sending as a message to the German society, that there should be a changes. For example, East-West divide. The biggest problem in the East-West divide is not going to be about migration from outside Europe. As I said, there is kind of a general policy. They're going to be different language. They're going to be people like Salvini and Torben, which is going to talk about bullshit. But at the end of the day, the biggest problem is going to be about internal Schengen freedom movement. Because what ECFR survey showed was that for East European societies, fear of your own people living is becoming bigger than the fear of foreigners coming. Let's give you the Romanian data. For the last 10 years, Romania is a country slightly above 20 million. 3.4 million Romanians left the country to live and work abroad. Around 70% of them are younger than 40. 10,000 doctors has left Romania in the last three years. Listen, this is a big issue. Most of these people are coming to Germany or to Western Europe. Um, but Germany is the most attractive market. So as a result of it, according to the survey, the majority of Hungarians, Poles, and Romanians are ready to support their government to constrain the rights of their own people to work abroad for a longer period of time. This is a totally different question than the question basically of getting people outside of Europe. So how to make the freedom of movement a two-way street, which I do believe is doable. But in order to be doable, we should recognize this as an issue, as a problem. The freedom of the individuals to move. Listen, I'm an example of one of those who move out. And by the way, Romanian elections had this result because a big number of Romanians living outside of Romania voted. There was one of the, and this is very important. This is why I has a huge sympathy towards basically your policy also respecting to some of the illiberal governments in Central and Eastern Europe. Because when you are basically starting to punish the country, then these people are using the anti brussels rhetorics and said, we are treated as a second class citizens. They're just exploiting us. So this is a very easy position because people feel as the losers also as a result of it. And also they have the feeling but you're doing this for your domestic publics. I'm just going to give one example is uh, Macron's famous directives of uh, how uh, East European uh, truck drivers uh, are going to be paid when they go in, uh, in France. Listen, I have a sympathy for this. And Macron was going to win East Europeans if he had said the following. I feel anger to see my co-citizens in the European Union being so badly paid for their work. So I insist, at least when they go through France, to have the same minimum wage like the French workers. If he has said this, believe me, he was going to be a popular hero in all of our countries.
But when he said, I want to introduce this policy in order to protect French workers from unfair competition, suddenly these very badly paid workers sided with the owners of these companies <laughs> and said, this is against Eastern Europe. Uh, so I do believe from this point of view, what you are saying, in my view, is very important because they should be rebridging between East and West. It's not going to be easy. Some of these governments are not going to disappear. It's going to be much easier now for the Polish government, particularly if they're going to win the elections in the autumn, to say, listen, we got the mandate of the people and people state, majority of people where we are. Support for the opposition, critically important. Uh, and trying to say this is politics. Uh, so on this, I'm very supportive. My question is also that why we're thinking about Europe, believing that the only thing that is happening is in Europe, many things are changing outside of Europe. And we are going to be forced to take positions. And some of these positions, we are not going to be so easy to influence. The divide is going to be strong because all, almost all, everybody outside of Europe is for different reasons ready to divide Europe in one or the other camps. And how to try to keep also a certain level of functional unity and not rhetorical unity in this situation is going to be a major challenge. So from this point of view, why I like the results of the elections, I do believe that they're not so easily going to be translated into effective common policies because of the things that we're talking about. But believe me, for a kind of a, a committed pessimist like this, I feel almost like on a wedding party after these elections. <laughs> Sehr schön. Ich, äh, Ivan Krastev hat gerade einen, einen Punkt gemacht. Ivan Krastev just made a point that is also very important for us in Germany. The central role played by Germany. Germany has to change for Europe being able to change. Let me ask you in how far can the change here solve things at the European level? And how is it possible under the change condition, the fragmentation, some things become easier, some blockages will uh, disappear because the Grand Coalition has disappeared, but it will also be more difficult to be able to act. I will answer your question in a minute. Let me first clarify one thing which is important for the German Greens. It doesn't, it is not correct that the Greens stand for a movement that criticizes the EU. There are on the one side those who criticize the EU from one aspect, from the right, like the Yellow Vest in France, and others criticize it from the left. Our, we always said we first defend what we have achieved, and based on this, we formulate tasks for change. We think it's very important. Those who are only for a different Europe are in reality against Europe, and the left party had to pay for it because just to be for something different is no longer pro-European. So this is something the Greens have learned, that only on the basis of a strong pro-European position you can demand for changes. And all those who are procrastinating in this level, I wonder how the interpreter translated this, only on this basis you can act in a credible way. Well, now the question uh, about opportunities to be able to act in the European Parliament, now the following is happening. What we do in the legislative in many fields now has to be agreed in a kind of coalition contract. I mean, perhaps it's not the right term. 
it will be an agreement based on major projects. I mean, this is at least our aim. And uh, it has to aim at compromises that are smart enough to bring the continent together rather than divide it. And now we all have to get out about the discourse bubble. And the uh, example you mentioned about the uh, lorry drivers is just to find a smart solution. Uh, and actually, there are more examples in different policy areas. One of the big questions is the wish for a more social Europe in the in Western and Southern Europe. And on the other hand, the desire to economically catch up in Eastern Europe. And I think there can be smart compromises between these positions. For instance, a Europe that uh, pushes future investments based on solidarity to equalize differences in between rich and poor future investments can be attractive to find such compromises or that compromises have to be found now our problem is how can we sell it to the council? The parliament has a lot of experience in formulating broad compromises. We do not manage everywhere, but in many areas. And now in the negotiations, well, there are parties that just want to divide the costs. What uh, will be given to the liberals, to the Christian Democrats, to the Social Democrats? Normally, we are not on this list, but of course, we will also make claims. And we have uh, priorities, and without these priorities, well, uh, there will be no deal with us when it comes to the commission president. So uh, solutions with regard to climate are a precondition for us to arrive at a deal about persons. And we have already noticed that this is something our partners in the council are not used to. One could say they do not need us. Numerically speaking, this is true. But in the big party groups, there are many strange members, and many do not want to depend on us. Mr. Weber does not want to depend on some of their strange member parties, and Mr. Mr. Orban is the strangest of them, and this same applies to the Social Democrats. You only mentioned the Romanian. You forgot uh, others like Malta that have problems. Uh, they also have strange members. And when you think of all of them and you do not want to depend on them, it might also be a good idea to take up some of the green demands in order to arrive at a broader pro-European majority. I think this is a debate that takes place in their parties. Do they want to operate with a very short majority depending on these strange parties, or do they want to have a pro-European stronger Green Party family? And we will only do this if the big future demands are also tackled. The compromise culture. So you emphasize polarization. But I would like to uh, ask you this question um, once more about the compromise culture. Is there, are there common topics to which populists from Central Eastern Europe, liberals from Denmark, Greens from Germany. Um, is there something they could agree on? Is there a common platform? Do you see that? 
listen, first, even this type of a populist are not the same. And this is one of the things, this is why it's very strange, because when you talk about populists, we normally know the populist in your own country. And then you try to imagine that basically everybody is like this. Uh, so first of all, none of these populists want to get out of the European Union. There is not a single, neither Mr. Orban nor Mr. Kaczynski, is dreaming their country to get out of the EU. Uh, because in a strange way also, most of these are nationalists in the absence of the national economy. Just keep in mind that 30% of the industrial production of Hungary comes from four German companies. So this is a world very different uh, than basically a classical world uh, of an interwar period and others. The strengths also of the Greens come from something which is not simply numbers. This is the vote of the younger generation. And there is only one war which we know how it's going to end up, and this is the intergenerational war. Uh, so from this point of view, having the young vote never is very important. But then here the Greens come of a problem of their own, and East Europeans, we know it very well. The younger generation in Europe, unlike in 1968, is a small cohort. And in Eastern Europe, basically, this is also not simply a small cohort, but also people who are massively leaving their country. So as a result of it, they do not have the same influence in the political system that you expect. And they're much more worried about the future than anybody else. So from this point of view, if you're going to cut the greens, not nevertheless of the results, or some of the uh, new kind of liberals that entered from Central and Eastern Europe, you're going into a generational war, which is not going to end up well. These people want a voice in the system. And I find this very important because it's also on the level of ideas. It's a level of a different sensitivities. I believe in a compromise. In Eastern Europe, we're not great on compromises. This you also should know. Uh, if you see the language of East European politics, and this doesn't start only with populists, most of our language borrows words from war, not from trade. And even Brits who basically using a trade words, you see that they're not succeeding very much in compromise these days. Uh, part of the polarization is the results of the changing structure of politics with the social media, with basically many other things. So this is not easy to make a compromise. Uh, but I very much liked the fact, and this is something that in my view was uh, absenting in some of the major parties. Everybody of the mainstream talking to the East believe that in order to have a value conversation, you should talk about money. This is not the way it's going to work. This can make people even more cynical than they are. Yes, you can push the countries to do this or that, uh, but it's much more important to understand why they keep the position that they have, why certain positions are right or wrong. By the way, the problem in the East is in a different place. Many of the young people in the East vote for the national populist parties. If you go on the opinion polls, as you know, Poland is highly pro-European. But the age group which is most skeptical about the European Union is between 18 and 25. This is a different demography of pessimism, let's put it like this. <laughs> uh, and I do believe fight is for this generation. And they should have basically representation in the debate, some of the ideas and others. And you also slightly, I mean, the Greens are much better represented in this because I very much agree with you. In order to make a change, you should recognize what worked, because just criticizing. But on the other side, you are less in a position to defend everything is your legacy, which the major parties are, because this was basically Europe run by the two big families. Uh, for me, this is interesting, because everybody is going to watch Germany very much. Uh, paradoxically, Macron lost the elections, but symbolically ended with much more influence, first because he came with the initiative, but secondly, everybody expected him to be crushed. And the very fact that he survived and Marine Le Pen didn't do as well as many expected makes him quite influential and the role of the liberals basically in the group. It's not the case, for example, with the CDU, CSU here, but this is not a victory that you're dreaming for. You're basically keeping the votes uh, but you don't keep the political influence that you have as a model. And many, many, many are going in the East to, ex to expect the answer of the question, how a possible, for example, uh, CDU Green Coalition is going to look like? What is going to be their position on Europe? What is going to be their response to Macron? What kind of a German, uh, different Germany, which is not obsessed with the black zero, which is not basically behaving as a pension fund? 
uh, which is afraid basically only what this is going to lose. How this uh, basically Germany is going to look like. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we come schon langsam ans Ende und, uh, ich well, we are now coming to the end almost, and I would like to um, approach Van Giegold with a question that uh, arose out of our question. So, in fact, there were many uh, differences or contradictions that were actually covered up with money in Europe. And the question is, what can we actually solve uh, with money. And Ivan Krastev has pointed out that not everything can be solved with money. So what can we do? The winners in France, uh, they were the Greens, not Macron. Uh, and this is something important. To, yeah. If you, if you see at the election results, basically um, the Liberals, they, they were rather stagnant in comparison to the former elections, uh, while the Greens were really out of nowhere, uh, back to a historic result, which is uh, really a strong turnout uh, for a Green vote. And uh, I have to say that here because uh, there's a certain debate in Germany around, um, well, the French Greens are, are over and we should all join Macron. Yeah? Uh, you know that Danny Kohn Bendit tortured us with uh, some media articles during the election campaign, but he was proven wrong by Yannick Jadot. And uh, the Greens are and remain a strong independent force in, in Germany as well as, uh, of course, in France. And only because you agree with each other on the uh, European ambition, you do not have to join their, uh, the group. Uh, and th this shows the need for an independent political ecology uh, in, um, in Europe as well, uh, in France as well as in Germany. And uh, I have to say that here for, for some reasons. Uh, uh, beyond that... Um, it was not for me. No, uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, but uh, you were building the bridge, so uh, it was a very constructive uh, contribution. So, uh, and... Um, so... Um, then zurück zu Ihrer Frage. Well, now I would like to come back to your question in German. The question was, well, n now uh, I lost, I forgot what I wanted to say. Well, uh, the money and, and covering up things. Well, uh, yeah, I think that it is very important next to funding or to, to money to build a m much more strongly a European identity. I think we might have a different views here. I'm not thinking of European identity, which replaces a national or regional identity, but a self-confident uh, European identity, as, like a statement. For years, I've criticized that um, there's uh, not the European flag at different events um, or that the European hymn is not being sung. Well, at um, an election campaign of the Greens, I did that. And, and the, I called for it, I asked for it, because I think that the power of identity should not be left to the right wing um, parties. But it is not an identity that considers the national or the regional to be outdated, but a European identity which is as self-confident as the uh, Romanians, for example, fight against the corruption in their country holding up Romanian and also European flags. So we should be equally self-confident. We should have a European self confidence and self-image based on the principles that are laid out in the treaties. Of course, we do not always stick to it. We have to point that out as well. But first of all, to say that we are glad about these European principles and values and also achievements like rule of law, democracy, human rights, we should emphasize this and link this to our own history of identity or identity narrative, and we should strengthen that. And this is actually quite fundamental. If you want to win back the hearts of the people for this Europe, and um, last sentence, for some of the projects that strengthen identity, of course, we need funding, we need money. For example, 
one of the most subversive projects is Erasmus for everyone, for example. If every young person would be able to do it funded by European money, then we had a generation, a new young generation who would uh, marry across the whole continent and this would lead to a civil society basis um, which is more European and more far rooted than we usually um, see in civil societies. And these kind of projects that strengthen a European identity are a key prerequisite in order to counter the new nationalists in the medium term. Thank you very much. I think we have neither seen the clear dystopic nor the clear positive or utopian um, solution. But what we actually did here is a um, comprehensive European discussion by opening up the view on um, Europe as a whole after the European elections. And how this all plays out individually will be shown in the afternoon panels where we will discuss in much more detail. Uh, so now I would like to thank Ivan Krastev and Sven Giegold for the great discussion uh, at the outset. Thank you very much.